Good evening and welcome to another episode of The Angry Astronaut. So a lot of exciting things going on with Artemis right now. Orion seems to be acing just about every test they put it through, including a very close approach to the lunar surface only 130 kilometers away. Obviously the closest that any human rated spacecraft has come to the moon in a very, very long time, about 50 years. So very exciting times, obviously, but as usual, I try to look a ways ahead. I, I guess, kind of being who I am, I like to look at what could go wrong with Artemis from here on out. No matter how well this test goes, what's likely to trip it up? And unfortunately, there's quite a few things. And one of the most obvious things is the fact that most people are not really aware of what NASA's plan actually is. All of the details of what's going to carry us from this moment, from Artemis 1, all the way to mankind's first interplanetary journey to Mars, and of course, a safe return. What is involved in this entire process. Do they really have that thoroughly figured out? And if not, do we have a good plan going right now? And that's something that really isn't being made very clear to anybody. And at least NASA doesn't seem to be explaining it in a tremendous amount of detail. Oh, we get stuff about how this is moon to Mars, and we get stuff about how this is going to the moon to stay, and we also get stuff about how it's the first woman, the first person of color to go to the moon, but we don't ever really get a comprehensive description of the plan. So that's what I'm here this evening to do for you guys, is to explain this plan to you and count down the top 10 flaws that this plan has, the top 10 reasons that it might fail, and the things that NASA needs to do to fix it. So get ready, it's coming at you right now. So here's number 10, and in many ways, some might argue that this should be number one. We don't have a clear mission, a clearly defined mission. Sometimes NASA says moon to Mars. Sometimes President Biden says first woman, first person of color on the moon. Sometimes we hear going to the moon to stay, but we never really get, you know, in a single sentence, what this mission is really all about. And that is a big problem, because if nobody understands this mission, or at least doesn't get the idea of what the long-term objective is in a quick and concise and easy-to-understand package, then how can people you know, be expected to support it, and how can the people they elect be expected to keep spending billions of dollars on it? So NASA really needs to firmly define the mission. And here's what I think the mission should be. And in some ways, I think NASA has kind of spelled this out, but not in so many words. The mission is to go to the moon to stay so that we can learn how to survive in interplanetary missions or interplanetary environments and then go to Mars to stay. Now, there are certain things that are added on to the description of that mission. We're going to the moon to stay and then transitioning the moon over to private corporations that will make use of the moon's vast resources, which our technology really needs. That's something that NASA never really goes into, but given the fact that they are transitioning low Earth orbit 
to the private sector. It only stands to reason that they're eventually going to do the same thing with the moon as they press further out into the solar system, and this needs to be the ongoing pattern. NASA does the trailblazing, and then the private sector does the colonizing. So we start with low Earth orbit, we move on to the moon, and then we move on to Mars. So in many ways, Artemis is the first expedition. The yeah, Mayflower, if you will, or the Christopher Columbus, whatever, you know, uh, historical precedence you want to use that establishes that first colony after which many, many more will follow. And that has not been thoroughly spelled out. Instead, we get maybe it's uh, all about sending a person of color and, an, and a uh, woman to the moon. I granted that's important that you know so many people have been cut out of this opportunity because of blind prejudice in the past. But we are not spending billions of dollars in 18 years worth of work just to send one woman and one person of color to the moon. That's just stupidly symbolic, and I really can't see how that would benefit anybody. And we're not doing this just to go to Mars. We're also doing this to establish a permanent presence on the moon. And as far as the plan is concerned, if that is the long-term objective, the moon to stay, going on to Mars, all of those details, there are lots of flaws in the plan that will trip all of that up before we even get started. Please subscribe! Three, two, one, boosters in ignition, and liftoff of Artemis 1. And here's problem number nine. The Artemis launch cadence sucks. What do I mean by that? Well, launching one rocket a year, at most, by the way, is not going to the moon to stay. It's not going to be able to establish anything resembling a permanent presence on the lunar gateway, let alone on the lunar surface. And at the very, very least, we need to establish a permanent presence on the lunar gateway the same way that we established a permanent presence on the ISS, and we can't do that with one SLS launch per year. Two per year might be able to handle it, just barely, but one per year will never be able to handle it, and it makes the entire program entirely too easy to cancel. And of course, the whole objective of going to the moon to stay this time cannot be accomplished with this kind of launch cadence. That needs to be fixed. And it's at this point that I'd like to give you a brief overview of what the plan actually is. And interestingly enough, according to NASA, the plan has already started. The human presence in LEO segment is already underway and about to transition over to the commercial sector. Next, we have the human lunar return segment. Quote, the segment includes the first human return to the moon in over 50 years and the first woman to set foot on the moon. Strangely enough, it does not mention the first person of color, but oh well. These missions will test and exercise the human landing system and transit systems, bringing two crew to the lunar surface for approximately 6.5 days for each mission. These missions will enable exploration of the moon and conducting a fundamental science and human research on the lunar surface, including permanently shadowed regions. Deployment of a communication satellite will also occur in this segment. Then we move on to the Sustained Lunar Presence segment, and that's where NASA starts getting a little bit more detailed. They'll have the flexibility to conduct sortie missions in addition to Artemis Base Camp or ABC missions. ABC missions will include delivery and testing of the foundation elements that are required to enable a sustained human presence on the moon, such as a pressurized rover, which you're going to be looking at here in a moment, and surface habitation. An unpressurized rover to carry crew and cargo will support some of those missions, significantly enhancing the science return from those missions. Once all elements are delivered, crews of four astronauts will descend to the surface and conduct exploration missions of at least 30 days duration. Activities in this segment will test the capabilities and operations that are required for human missions to Mars and include extended exploration of the lunar surface, deploying experiments and con conducting research 
and support science and utilization. In addition, the Gateway will be deployed in cis lunar space. A series of Mars analogs will be conducted at the Gateway and on the lunar surface to simulate portions of the crewed Mars mission. These analogs will allow NASA to reduce risk in future missions. Additionally, key elements of the Mars transportation system, such as propulsion and habitation systems, will be tested in cislunar space during this segment. Now here is the next problem. The Lunar Gateway is being taken out of the equation and delayed way too long. That is a serious problem. And why is this a problem? Well, we have to go back to the whole reason that we're doing this in the first place. Number one, to go to the moon to stay. Number two, to prepare for a journey to Mars. If the Lunar Gateway is not deployed yet, so many experiments that are required in order for us to learn how to conduct interplanetary missions cannot be carried out. The Lunar Gateway is sort of a simulation of an interplanetary vessel. In addition to that, it allows us to establish a permanent presence in lunar orbit far earlier than we're going to be establishing a permanent presence on the surface of the moon. It also allows us to support a presence on the moon a lot more effectively. So if we want to go to the moon with the objective of going to Mars and also go to the moon to stay, then why not put the best tool for accomplishing that in orbit as rapidly as possible? But instead, we've taken the lunar gateway out of the critical path and who knows how long it's going to be before it actually gets deployed. That is a big mistake. And it kind of bleeds into the next problem with the NASA Artemis plan, and that is the sustained lunar presence phase is not really well thought out. The objectives as spelled out in the plan are as follows. Number one, to establish the Artemis base camp at the south pole of the moon. Okay. Number two, execute at least 30-day lunar surface missions, and then find Finally, to develop the gateway in lunar orbit to provide a permanent command center at the moon, provide for logistics aggregation, and leverage its capabilities to advance deep space science and technology development. How the hell are you supposed to do that with one launch per year? There's no way the gateway can become a permanent command center at the moon if you're only launching a single SLS rocket every year. This has to change, and I know I kind of tied that in with the launch cadence problems, but my point is these problems never seem to get rectified during the entire duration of the sustained lunar presence mission. And let's have a quick look at a graphic that kind of lays out the sustained lunar presence portion of this mission, just to give you an idea of how impossible all of this is going to be with only one SLS rocket per year. And while we're looking at the first step, that also illustrates yet another problem with this mission. The integration of commercial launch providers is not thoroughly spelled out ahead of time. All we have is the SpaceX Falcon Heavy providing resupply to the Gateway. But as you can see, one of the first things that gets deployed to the lunar surface during this phase is a lunar terrain vehicle and a fission surface power plant. How the hell are you supposed to deploy that to the lunar surface unless you dedicate an SLS to it? Unless you're using a big commercial rocket, in which case you should be planning those kinds of missions if those things are going to be deployed on the surface before you start having this sustained lunar presence phase. But guess what? That's not spelled out. They don't even have any planned contracts to be awarded for this phase. After that, crew are going to be staying on the gateway for 30 to 60 days out of the year. That's not full time, not even close, but at least we're getting somewhere. However, it's also important to note that even during the sustained lunar presence phase, you actually don't have astronauts staying on the moon very long, at least at the beginning. Only about six and a half days on the lunar surface, even though they're staying on the gateway for 30 to 60 days. That means that nothing in the way of permanent has habitation is being set up on the lunar surface all the way through Artemis 5 and maybe Artemis 6. After that, 
that cargo missions deliver a pressurized rover, EVA suits, in situ resource utilization pilot plant. So all of that has to get established, obviously, before we can have a more permanent mission established. But even after that, you're looking at two crew spending approximately 15 days on the surface. One 15-day mission per year this late in the program. And at this point, we're probably at Artemis 6 or Artemis 7. So herein lies another weakness. Astronauts are not staying long enough on the moon early enough in the program in order to deliver tangible results. But let's get back to the graphic again. It's only more than halfway through the sustained lunar presence mission that you actually get a surface habitat deployed on the moon. And of course, that hasn't really been thought through either, although the Europeans have a pretty good idea on what they would like to deploy on the moon. We'll get to that in a moment though. And then as you can see, we move on to 105 days on the gateway and finally, four crew spending 32 surface days or so on the lunar surface, and then finally transitioning to 205 days on the gateway with, again, four crew members spending about 32 days on the surface of the moon. This means that NASA is not seriously planning to simulate a full duration Mars mission, that is to say 205 days on the gateway exposed to all the dangers of interplanetary travel, including all of the cosmic rays, solar radiation, etc., until Artemis 9 or Artemis 10, perhaps sometime in 2035 if everything goes well. And as I feared, there's just too damn much in this plan to fit it into a single video, so we're going to have to continue everything next time. Please subscribe. We are so close to 90,000 now, less than 200 subscribers to go. Please check the description for various ways to support my content, and as always, stay angry about space!